Hello, I'm Peter Dixon. I'm a voiceover artist. I'm also a director and founder of Gravy for the Brain. Before I went freelance as a, as a proper kind of freelance voiceover artist, a gun for hire, uh, I was uh, I, I did various jobs. I was a I was a radio presenter. I was uh, I also did journalism for a while. I was a uh, a radio and television journalist. I was a sub editor on television news. But um, I was a terrible journalist, absolutely hopeless, uh, probably one of the worst ever. And I soon discovered, after a year or two of doing that, that really journalism wasn't in my blood. I wasn't terribly good at it. In fact, I wasn't good at it at all. Uh, but, but what I did discover, and this is always a process of discovery in any, anything you do in life, is that you, you try different things, don't you? And then you, you eventually find something that you're naturally attracted to, and you're either, you know, you're good at it naturally or you you get trained to a point where you're good at it so I was attracted to uh, to presenting work to being a DJ a presenter news reader um, and then the natural kind of progression from that place is to you know branch out even further and do voice acting uh, in computer games for instance which I did quite a lot of and I also do a lot of corporate work as well, a lot of corporate audios and what are called now video corporate explainers where we, you know, companies will engage you to explain their new product or service. Uh, and I, I, I began to sort of absorb all this and learn as much about it as I could. And that's how I really got into it. Uh, and uh, I've had a fantastically long career doing what I love, which is you know, the place where you really want to be, of course, doing what you love, then every day you get up and go to work, it doesn't feel like work. It feels like you're actually just doing your hobby and people are paying you to do that. So um, I, uh, I would say that um, I found where I want to be. Uh, it took a while, but I'm now doing what I want to do. And in fact, it's the only thing I can do. I'm probably unemployable in any other capacity. <laughs> Well, I started my, well, my interest goes back to when I was about four, and I really loved listening to the radio, even at four and five. My father had a radio set, and I used to listen to uh, all the old radio shows on, on the radio, and loved hearing those wonderful voices coming out of the radio set. And one day I said to myself, um, I would like to be doing that work. I wanted to get into the radio and do that, do what, do what, uh, what I heard those people doing. So I, I had to work out a way of doing it. Now, I, I did a degree, I went to university. There weren't any media courses in those days, so I picked a course, uh, I think I picked the first thing that sort of jumped out at me, which was psychology, I don't know why. I was quite interested in psychology, I still am. Uh, and I did a degree in psychology, and while I was at university, I, um, I started working on the uh, city hospital radio station. So I started helping out initially, and then eventually they gave me gave me my own show, which was brilliant. So I learned a lot about you know working on microphone, playing records, interviewing people, um, and so on. So I, I started. That's where where it really started for me. It wasn't a job as such. I wasn't paid for it. It was a totally voluntary thing. And then I moved into um, working for. Um, a radio station called BBC Radio Ulster, uh, which was a regional radio station back in the day in Belfast. It's still there. Um, and I, I joined the, the radio station while I was at university, funnily enough, and uh, did part-time work for them. And they did pay me for that. Uh, not very much, <laughs> but it was my very first professional job, was working as a radio announcer, reading the weather forecast uh, and reading the news and doing very odd announcing duties here and there. It was a wonderful experience and um, I c continued doing that for about I think about four or four years or so and then I moved to London to BBC Radio 2 where the journey continued for another 10 years with the BBC. Well you know the voiceovers have been around for a long time ever since recorded media really but they weren't called voiceover in those days they were just called you were either a journalist or broadcaster or or whatever but the term voiceover is a comparatively new one um, and so when I used to tell people I was a voiceover artist they would look at me quite blankly and nobody knew what it was and then you'd sort of try and explain it and they'd still look rather blankly at you uh, uh, at a dinner party or in a pub if somebody said what do you do 
But now I think you know um, I don't know why. Perhaps it's because uh, you know we all we talk about it a lot more. There are a lot more people doing it. it it's um, it's a term that is now more familiar. So when people ask me what I do, uh, I'm very happy to say I'm a voice artist. In fact, I probably tell everybody I meet that I'm a voice artist, and they are naturally curious, and they are they are always very keen to find out you know what programs I've worked on, what projects I've done. And, uh, and I'm very happy to talk about it because, you know, talking about it to people who aren't in our business is actually, um, aside from giving, giving them your business card, is a great way of promoting what you do as a business because you can, um, you can tell somebody what you do and then they'll go away and maybe three months later, six months later, or even years later, they'll remember uh, when they need a voice over and say, oh, I know there's a guy who can do that and they'll get in touch with you again. So. Yeah, telling people what you do is great, but I think probably I probably talked about being a voiceover comfortably about 15 years ago when um, it was kind of becoming more um, commonplace, if you like. I think being successful in any business, I mean, not just voiceover, but anything, is a gradual, a very gradual process. I'm not a big fan of overnight, uh, overnight success because um, it doesn't equip you for the long haul and like any skill set, any skill that you want to learn, it takes a long time, particularly with voiceover and, uh, and voice acting. It's uh, such a huge subject. There are so many things to learn, not just about marketing but about engineering your own sessions, recording, how to edit, how to deliver the lines, knowing how to deliver those lines, how to interpret other people's copy, etc, etc, etc. It's a vast subject and one I'm still learning to this very day. Well, when I was working for the BBC, um, at BBC Radio 2, I had nine, ten years there, uh, a chap I worked with called Ian Purden, he was the editor of the, of the BBC Radio 2 announcing team, and uh, I said to him, I broached the subject with him, I said, look, I want to go freelance, I want to, you know, go and do more of this stuff outside of the BBC and the BBC contracts back then were quite tight. I wasn't able to do any commercial work for instance because being a newsreader on the ra on radio meant that um, there may be a conflict of interest one day if there was a story about a, a company that I was the voice of, some negative connotation, you get the picture. So I said to him, um, look um, I'm, I'm thinking of jumping ship and going freelance and he said well, look I'll tell you what I'll do for you, he said I'll give you you know, a cushion so that at least you've got some income in case it all goes wrong and if it does go wrong you can come back. So he was very generous and I owe him a great debt of gratitude. So I did maybe two or three, four shifts um, a week or a month, I can't remember what the actual regularity was but it was enough to allow me to leave the BBC and go and seek uh, other work and spend my time doing that. So I'm, uh, I'm delighted that that was uh, something that the BBC allowed me to do and that's how I then made the transition into full-time voiceover. Eventually, uh, my freelance voiceover work took over. I was getting more and more um, you know, contracts, more and more people were coming to me for, for voice work, uh, mainly in the commercial sector. I started doing commercials for, um, for, for independent local radio stations, and it meant in those days, these were the days before ISDN and digital transmission, and uh, there was a gang of, you know, about 20 of us who used to, it sounds like a gang sounds rather ominous, it's like we, <laughs> we were a very jolly crew, but we used to drive around um, all over the country, you know, from London to Newcastle to Bristol, uh, up to Manchester and down to Plymouth, and we'd visit these radio stations and, you know, you'd walk in the door, they'd put a cup of coffee in one hand and a sheaf of scripts in the other, and you'd just read maybe 20, 25 radio commercials in your own natural voice, some of them, some of them demanded character voices. It was a most fantastic, uh, high pressurised, high paced job, but it was so much fun, but incredibly wearing. And so I was delighted when, you know, ISDN came along and digital delivery came along. I could work from home and be in Glasgow one minute and in New York the next, you know, it, was, it made it so much easier and so much less demanding, not just on me, but on my on the cars I was having to change every year because I was doing so many miles. I think the biggest achievement, I did, there's nothing really that stands out as one thing, but the biggest achievement if I was to be, you know, if I was to introspect and be honest about it, I think it would be that uh, I've managed to survive <laughs> so long. 
you know, it's been um, it's been surprising to me, really. I, I didn't think that I would ever end up doing this as a full-time job. If you asked me, you know, if we went back and interviewed the 24-year-old Peter Dixon, I would, I would be uh, aghast, not aghast, not the right word, I'd be astounded. That's a better word, isn't it? Astounded, really, as to how much I've done and where I've been and, and who I've worked for and all the different lovely people I've met and wonderful projects. And not only that, but I've managed to make it my living. I've earned good money doing it. It wasn't always the way. Uh, in fact, it was. Uh, there were several times in my career where I almost felt like giving up and there was no network as there is now. We'd no gravy for the brain. There was no uh, email networks. There were no, no Facebook groups. There was nothing. And so we just had to rely on each other, our own little band of friends that we, we, we met and knew. But there were times when it was tough, you know, and I, I was, uh, I didn't know how I was going to pay my mortgage. It was, uh, it was difficult uh, in some, on some occasions. But, uh, you know, if I was just being brutally honest, I'd say, well, I'm still here, I've survived, uh, I'm still surviving, I'm still working um, every day in this business, and uh, I absolutely love every second of it. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I think that's the one thing I'm most pleased about, really. Trying to think of something now that would be clean. Well, I, as you probably know, I do, and the voice of The X Factor on ITV. 15 years that's been running as this is being recorded. I can't believe it. We're going into our 15th year. Every year, you know, just after the judges' houses and all that process has gone through, I get uh, emailed to me the list of the uh, finalists, the final 12. And I always look forward to getting that list because I scan down the list and I, I look for interesting names to say. And I always hope that there's going to be another Rachel Adadeji. Every year I, I love uh, looking at the names, look for particularly for the number, number of syllables contained within those names. And um, I can't remember how, long, how many years ago, maybe nine years ago, I, I lose track, uh, this list came through and one of the names was uh, Joe McKeldry. So I, I, he, was, he won the X Factor that year, and I, I, um, I record these names in advance, so they use them throughout the whole series. So I read out the name uh, Joe McKeldry several ways, um, and with all the other names, all the other 11 names, just sent it in, and uh, the show went on air, the final happened, I went down to the final, went to the uh, after-show party afterwards, and Joe McKeldry's father came up to me, and he said, uh, you know, you've, uh, you've got our name wrong. And I said, I, I didn't realize I got your name. What, what is your, your name's Joe, your son's name is Joe McKelvey, isn't it? He said, no, 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 it's Joe McElderry. And <laughs> I thought, I've just renamed this poor lad in front of 15 million people and now he's known as Joe McKeldry. And he continues to be known as Joe McKeldry. And um, <laughs> he, was, the thing, he was far too shy and too sort of nice to say anything at the time to cause a fuss. So he just let it go, and uh, but his family must have been aghast when I, when they switched on their TV to hear me announce their son on the final of the X Factor, Joe McKeldry. Can you imagine the, the horror that must have caused? Anyway, it's all water under the bridge, and uh, we're still friends. Oh my goodness me, we've seen such change in this industry. Um, and I don't think we're the only industry that's seen change. Uh, when I started out uh, way back in this late 70s, early 80s, uh, we were working with tape machines and vinyl records. And, you know, it was very, very analog, very uh, a whole new, a whole different set of skills that you needed to have in order to do this thing. But then, of course, in those days, you didn't do it all yourself. That when, you, when you went to record, um, the no such thing as home recording studios back then. So when you went to, to work, you, you went to a professional studio that had you know, professional tape recording machines and an engineer, and all you had to do was sit in front of the microphone and do your thing. So now I think it's, uh, it's so much different. You know, it's, uh, it's, we, are, we have to wear so many hats nowadays as voice artists. We are the marketer, we are the, um, the talent, we are the accountants. We're the debt collectors, we are uh, engineers, we're technicians, uh, we're IT department, we, we are our own IT people. So all these skill sets, um, so many more things we need to know and, uh, and, and uh, 
you know, unless you've got all those ducks in a row and you know how to do all those things, uh, you're really not going to make it very far in this business. You might get some way, but in order to be really super good at all those things is, um, is really a requirement now. Uh, and so that's why Gravy for the Brain exists, to teach people all these different skill sets that you need to do these things. And if you're not prepared to do them, well, get out of town. So the favourite thing is, you're your own boss, first of all. You dictate when and where you work. Um, you take holidays when you want. I don't have to ask anybody if I, I need to take a holiday. The only problem is when you're freelance, you take very few holidays because well, you end up taking your microphone and laptop with you on holidays and working on holidays. And it's the one thing that really annoys my wife intensely is that uh, you know we go on holidays and suddenly the phone rings and oh my goodness me, I've got to set up a, a recording studio in a hotel bedroom using pillows and duvets and God knows what. Um, but. It's important, uh, even, uh, no matter how inconvenient it is, it's important to maintain those um, relationships with your clients. <clears throat> and they don't work to your you know, agenda. Uh, they need you then, and so you've got to you know, deliver the, uh, your, your service to them when they, when they need it. Otherwise, they'll go somewhere else. So my ins inspiration comes from listening to the radio, going to the movies, um, listening to um, other people's work on TV, uh, uh, Spotify, podcasting, you name it, everything. I'm like a sponge. I, I absorb all of that stuff and I'm inspired, not by all of it, but by a great deal of it. When I hear somebody doing particularly good work, I make it my business to you know, drop them a line or give them a call and say, that was really, really excellent. I enjoyed that. You did a great job on that. And likewise, when, when I... Uh, uh, anybody hears me doing something it's always very nice to get a personal text or a note from a mate saying you know that was a really good good thing you did so I think I'm I'm inspired by lots of different things and lots of different people and continuously learning and absorbing the three things I would say if you're starting out in this business in fact there are more than three there's probably about 3,000 things I'll tell you but to boil it down one is Get trained, because this business isn't just about speaking anymore, it's not about reading scripts, it's so much more. So you, in order to be successful, like I said earlier, you've got to be uh, trained in all the different skill sets that you'll need to succeed. So get trained is important. Gravy for the Brain, this is another plug. I'm shameless really when it comes to Gravy for the Brain, because I think it's such a great resource. Uh, and for everybody, not just people starting out of course, it's great for people who, are in, who have been in the business for quite some time. So I think. Yeah, I think that's the first thing, get trained. Number two is uh, practice daily uh, in whatever genre you're working in, whatever accent you want to perfect. Make sure you spend time working on your, deli on your delivery and on your vocal styles and accents, dialects. If that's your thing, of course it may not be, but if you just want to do documentaries, you should be practicing different styles of documentary from nature to industrial to um, you know crime whatever you know whatever documentary genres there are within that genre practice those styles so that whenever you're presented with that script you know exactly uh, how to how to approach it how to deliver those lines it's all very subtle differences so training practice what's the third thing pray you're going to need a lot of luck. But then you see you can create your own luck uh, by uh, your own marketing and your own branding, telling your story, connecting with your audience, connecting with people who will employ you, um, you know, all those things that you need to do in order to uh, get your message out there, websites, business cards, talking about what you do. And then, you know, just pray because you're going to need that luck. But, but make, make sure you make that luck happen. Because that, those are the three things I'd say that if you're starting out in this business, you need to pay attention to.